Hi there to everyone who's joining us. Hopefully you guys can see all four of us on your screens there. If you can't, let us know. I always want to say, if you can't hear us, let us know, but that's, <laughs> that's a problematic phrase in itself for this kind of a platform. <laughs> mm -hmm. It looks like we've got a couple people commenting. Thanks so much. We're going to get started in, in just a minute here. I know for webinars, it always takes people just an extra 30 seconds or, or a minute or so to kind of get their technology on, find their links buried deep within the depths of their email accounts. So we'll give people just another couple of seconds. It looks like they're joining kind of rapidly now. So just a minute and then we'll kind of get kicked off with everyone. Awesome, loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you for that confirmation. We appreciate it. <laughs> And it's always fun in these to hear where people are watching from. So um, if you've if you've got a minute and you're handy at the keyboard, let us let us know where you're where you're watching from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see Andrew sure. from Kentucky. It looks like New Hampshire. Yeah. Oh, Kenai. Oh, yeah. yeah. Very cool. <laughs> Midwest, California. These are always so fun because we we mm -hmm. all, we get providers literally from all over the country. It's so cool. Hey, John. <laughs> Watching from the level on assignment. <laughs> on assignment with us. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. You you may know the answers to some of these questions we're going to address <laughs> today, John. <laughs> okay. We get, we get a lot of people from Florida. It's cool to see. We've got a, a good amount from there. Yeah. Yeah, we really do. Yeah. Be sure to share where you're from. We love seeing that come in. And we're going to go ahead and, and kick off here. I'm sure people will continue kind of joining over the next um, couple of minutes, but we want to kind of get this thing going pretty well on time because we've got a lot to cover today and we're going to plan to pretty much fill this whole entire hour with information for you guys. So welcome. We're super excited to have you here. My name is Deanna Tiemann. I'm the marketing director here at WMS. If you learned about this webinar via email, it's probably because I sent it to you. So <laughs> I help with all the marketing here. I'll be your moderator today. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guest contributors that we have here. And then I'll let them just say a little bit about themselves and I'll let them tell you where they are logging in from and joining us uh, from here today. I'm in Spokane, Washington, so it's the other side of the state that's not Seattle. We're right next to Idaho here in Spokane. It's a beautiful fall day here. And next, I want to introduce you to Ethan McWilliams, who is our co-CEO here at WMS. Ethan brings a wealth of information about the business side of locum tenens and also the attributes that we look for in healthcare providers before we place them on assignment. Welcome, Ethan. Thanks, Deanna. Hi, everyone. I'm Ethan. I'm coming to you from Livingston, Montana, which is a small town about 25 miles east of Bozeman. Um, it's a uh, cool, clear day over here. Really happy to have all of you joining us and uh, happy to be here with you as well. Awesome. Thank you. Next up, we've got Jade King, who is our general manager here at WMS. Jade has years of experience working in the healthcare field, and she works directly with both our staffing and our operations teams internally here at WMS. Jade is a pro at logistics. So when healthcare providers are ready to go out on assignment, she is ready to get them started. So they've got everything set up. Um, Jade, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Deanna. I am coming out of beautiful Mesa, Arizona. So I'm just outside of Phoenix. Uh, luckily survived the summer and now the next six months are my reward. So today's also a beautiful day here. I've been lucky enough to be with WMS for four years now and um, healthcare for about 14 years. So um, super excited to be here. Thank you. Well, we're super excited to have you here with us, Jade. All right. And last but not least, we are super fortunate to have Joseph Burwell, PAC, joining us on our guest panel today. Joseph is one of our contracted locum tenens healthcare providers with Wilderness Medical Staffing and has been on assignments in both Alaska and Montana. 
In addition, we are very excited because Joseph is also our very first WMS provider of the year. So Joseph comes equipped with a lot of firsthand stories and experiences that we are very thankful to have him here for to share throughout this presentation today. So thanks so much for joining us today, Joseph. Happy to be here, Deanna. Thank you for having me. Um, I, I'm often talking to people about wilderness medical. So this seems like a pretty normal day for me. Um, people have questions and hopefully we'll have some answers. Awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, Joseph, where are you joining us from today? Oh, I'm in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Um, happens to be my hometown. I came back to after nearly 30 years all over the world, really. And um, it's also home to uh, Wake Forest University PA school. I went to the, uh, the PA school, the second oldest PA program in the country. Awesome. So, just a few beautiful day here. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. All right. Well, first, I want to thank all of our providers and uh, people who were invited to this webinar who went ahead and submitted us uh, questions. And we're very, very thankful to those for those. We've gone ahead and, and put them together and we're hoping to get through as many as we can. We've compiled about a list of 20 or so questions that we're hoping to go through with you. Um, so we're going to kind of start from the beginning, how we've got this structured. So it's kind of starting from the beginning of, of the first things you need to know about locum tenens and then working all the way through kind of the process into kind of more of those questions that are geared toward what it's like to actually be on assignment. Um, and as you can see, you've got the chat going there on the side. You're able to ask questions and just comment in with different things. And we have a few of our staff members who are in on the webinar who will be answering questions. So if you've got like some follow-ups to some of the responses that we're giving, go ahead and feel free to ask in the question tab. Um, we've got like half of our, our team is here. So um, Lisa from recruiting should be on the chat. Diane and Sheila from our staffing department should be here. And then Ashley and Katie from operations. And there is a chance too that, that Mary Ellen might be um, sneaking into the webinar too, our, our founder, Mary Ellen Doty. I don't know that she'll chat in, but uh, she might. So yeah, hi, Sheila. You can see Sheila there. So if you've got additional follow-up questions to kind of the topics that we're going after, over, feel free to just put those in the chat and we will try to answer as, as many as we can. Oh, look, Mary Ellen is there. Hi, Mary Ellen. <laughs> she said she'll always chat. That's that's true. So uh, thanks thanks to our WMS team for, for being here as, as backup. We appreciate it. So to get started, we've got a few questions that came in kind of with providers wondering a little bit more about our overall scope of business, kind of what type of providers we work with, where we serve specialties, that sort of stuff. Ethan, can I have you kick us off with some more information about that for us today? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as Deanna mentioned, we got a number of questions and I saw some commentary, including from Josh here in the chat about where we staff. So just kind of figured it would uh, make sense to start with some level settings. So uh, Wilderness Medical Staffing was founded in 2010 by Mary Ellen, who was working then as a nurse practitioner in Alaska. Uh, and it was started with the specific mission of providing excellent staffing support to rural and remote communities. Um, that mission remains a really important part of who we are today. That rural remote focus remains key to everything we do as a company. We staff providers with rural experience in rural areas. We hire internal people with that background as well. Um, initially, it just started very small in Alaska. We've grown to staff five states. So we work in Alaska, Montana, Wyoming, Washington, and Idaho currently. Um, the specialties that we typically work with are going to be the ones you see in rural areas. So really heavy in emergency medicine, family medicine, urgent care, some hospitalist stuff, but those kind of core rural specialties are what we're all about. And that's where we're structured around. Um, another kind of brand of this sort of question that we get a lot is um, what types of facilities do you staff? Uh, a big part of our business and the communities we work with are tribal. Uh, we also work, uh, so I grew up in an Alaska native village, uh, which is one of the places we staff in Tanana, Alaska. 
another example would be a critical access hospital um, like the one that is in the town that I live in now. So um, we really run everything in between that, but that's kind of the core focus of the business. Um, and the kind of final variation of this question that I saw when we were preparing for this was, um, what's the concentration like? So predominantly the business operates in Alaska and Montana. We've gotten demand for more positions in Wyoming and Idaho and Washington recently, and we've continued to grow the business in that direction. But um, if you go on our website right now, you'll see that most of the jobs are in Alaska and Montana um, in, in those specialties that I kind of laid out there. Did I, hit, did I hit everything you wanted there, Deanna? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that synopsis. All right. And yeah, if you have more questions about that, feel free to chat them over. Okay. So now we're going to kick off the Q&A portion. Ethan, I'm going to put you on the spot again. The first couple questions are a little bit more, more business related. So Ethan and Jade, I'm going to have you kind of help us out with these few questions. So let's start at the very beginning. Ethan, what does it mean to be an independent contractor and how does that relate to, to locum tenants? Yeah, so as a preface, I would just say that the locum tenants industry predominantly is structured around medical providers working as independent contractors or sometimes they're referred to as 1099s. And what that essentially means is that you're self-employed. So you're, you're using the clinical skills that you developed in your training and then in your experience in the real world and you're going out and using them almost as a trade. Um, and the, the basic kind of run of that, compared to being an employee, you are responsible for providing some of the core benefits like health insurance, um, you know, vacation, PTO. Those you do not get as an independent contractor. But the, the real advantage of it, what we've heard over the years um, people enjoy most, is you have total control of your schedule you have the opportunity to decide where you work, when you work, and how you do it. Um, and yeah, I think one other thing I put just under this kind of broad category of independent contractor stuff is, you know, if you've worked as an employee healthcare provider before and you're thinking about this transition, it's really important to consider who would be your support staff as you make that transition. So. I always recommend when I talk to providers that you consider finding an accountant you trust, potentially a lawyer, um, because you really are, you're, you're starting a business, the business is you, uh, but it but that's kind of the endeavor. So uh, I think that's a really important piece of it. Yeah, great information. Thank you, Ethan. Jade, I will ask you this question uh, next and, and anyone can feel free to add to it if you'd like to. How do providers get paid as a 1099 contractor? How does that work? Yep. <clears throat> Happy to take it on. Um, so we use a software program called Bullhorn. Um, and on the first day of your first assignment, you will get your own login credentials for your Bullhorn profile. Um, and then you you then go to uh, to your profile to complete your invoice every two weeks where you'll upload how many days you worked, if it's maybe a daily rate for the assignment you're working. Um, if you're on an hourly assignment, you would upload how many hours you worked, how many on-call hours you worked. Um, and then we do pay every two weeks and we just deposit that directly into your, your banking account. Um, also kind of going along the same lines, if you happen to have like anything you need to be reimbursed for, that's the same place you would submit receipts to. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the gist of that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's somewhat similar to how mm -hmm. an employee gets paid, but it, you have to, you have to file things a little bit differently um, mm -hmm. so we can track it differently on our end. Yes. Um, you'll, yeah, it works directly with our accounting department. So if you may, if you may be make a mistake or if you don't know what to do, um, our accountants can definitely help you out and kind of explain like how to fill out your invoice. Um, a member of our team, Tanner, actually created a really cool YouTube video about 10 minutes long. Um, so we can send you that link as well. And it, and it explains how to fill out an invoice or how to submit your receipts for reimbursement. So try to help everybody feel supported along the way. Yeah, but we're yeah. also always ha happy to answer questions if you have questions at that at that stage. Perfect, um, Ethan. Back to you. Somebody had asked about this, and I think it's an important one to to touch on. Are pay rates negotiable, or how does that work? How does the pay work for the different positions? 
Yeah, so this is handled differently throughout the industry. The model that we have settled on as a company from the earliest days is to be transparent with people right out the gate what the rate is for the position. So if you go on our website right now, um, you can see all of the open jobs. All of them have the pay structure in there and a specific amount assigned to it. Um, the pay typically is not negotiable. And the reason is we've gone to the client already and we've looked at factors like where the location is, what the skill level is, um, you know, the market in that particular field. And we've already negotiated the most competitive rate that we can for the provider with the client. And because we're a small company, we can charge a, a very lean margin. So we've already done all the negotiation up front. Um, so typically we don't negotiate during the pay process. But again, um, we really pride ourselves on the transparency side. You can go look. I, I think I don't know how other camp companies handle that, but I, I would say we're probably in the minority for being able to offer that level of transparency. And it's one of the things we try to do throughout the whole staffing process is tell you exactly what you're signing up for, what you'll be paid, remove some of the question marks around being a locum and going somewhere new and doing something different. Awesome. Deanna. Yeah, go ahead, Joseph. Deanna, can I add one thing about yeah, being a 1099? Um, almost everything in your life becomes tax deductible. So it's true. Uh, Ethan said, get a CPA. I've, I've had the same CPA since 1998. Um, you can tax deduct the winter coat you bought for Alaska. You can, anyway, everything, your CME is tax deductible and uh, just keep receipts. Yeah, that's yeah. a great, that's yeah. a great point. Yeah. Yeah. Th thanks for adding that. And um yeah, I'll, Ethan, I'll have you kind of start this next question. And then, Joseph, I, I'd love to hear kind of your your experience with this, just being an independent contractor. But let's talk for a second, since this is a question that comes up all of the time. How does your own personal medical insurance work as an independent contractor? Do we provide medical insurance? Do they have to get their own? How does that situation work? And then I'll do a follow up to that after you guys respond. So, Ethan, go ahead and, and kick this one off. Yeah. So as I mentioned before, as an independent contractor, you are responsible for procuring your own health insurance. It's kind of the trade-off for the flexibility that you get with being an independent contractor. You're not tied down to one facility, but then you don't get the same benefits. Um, in my experience, providers have tackled that. It is a challenge. They've tackled that challenge through a number of different means. So we've had people who use their spouse's health insurance through their employment. We have retired military who do that. We have reservists who buy TRICARE. Um, let's see, some people will work locums part-time. So they'll come with us for a couple weeks at a time while they have a full-time position somewhere else that does provide that benefit. And then there's also a range of um, opportunities to buy in a state or private exchange where you can go purchase a policy for a short-term or long-term so there's a number of different ways you can tackle it. There are some good resources online. Um, this is uh, one of the things I, I overdue to get to Deanna eventually is a blog on this topic where we kind of break down some of the solutions that providers have come up with for this and what worked for them. Um, but in the meantime, I'll, I'll drop a link in the chat to something that I found particularly helpful. But I too, I wanna hear uh, Joseph's take on this as well. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, in, in terms of medical insurance for myself, healthcare insurance, I have the tremendous privilege to, to get my care at the VA. Um, but having said that, my wife recently retired and she's not um, Medicare age yet. So she did what you were describing of just searching online at different uh, commercial uh, packages you can buy. And um, and she found you know several good ones and ultimately chose one now with uh, open enrollment about to start. So it can be done. You know, I, I think oftentimes in this country, we have the idea that, well, if your job doesn't provide insurance, you're doomed. That's just not the case. Um, uh, you can find reasonably priced commercial packages with you know, reasonable deductibles, depending on uh, how you want to gain that, uh, if you feel lucky. <laughs> Perfect. I'm going to do a follow up question because I don't think we're going to address this later. Somebody had asked in the chat about medical malpractice insurance. That's thanks. different. And so, um, Ethan, can you touch on that for just a second? Yeah, thanks. I saw a couple of questions come in and, and we're rolling here. So um, 
thanks to everyone for contributing. We'll try to cover everything we can. Um, before I do the med mail one, the med just, just Jack on your question. Um, so before we staff anyone on an assignment, we tell them exactly what the requirements of a position are. And so we'll look at your skill set. We'll look at your, we do like a skills checklist. We have you talk with our team about what you're comfortable with. And then we match that with the client. So um, if you have um, a particular specialty that you're comfortable with, but maybe not others, we can we can try to tailor an assignment for you. Uh, some of our assignments, you got to do everything. I think Joseph's going to talk about that in a little bit here. But uh, um, one of the things we pride ourselves on and we put a lot of emphasis internally on is making sure the fit is right. And that that goes both directions. So we want you to fit well with the client but we also want you to feel comfortable as well. So I just wanted to hit that one really quick. On the medical malpractice piece, um, this is true throughout the industry. Uh, basically, one of the roles that a locums agency provides in the process is securing that medical malpractice for you. Now, it only covers you for the locums work you do. So if, you're, if you own your practice or something like that on the side, you would still need to get your own policy for that. But when you're on an assignment with wilderness, we, we have a, we've negotiated a policy, um, an A rated policy that works across all specialties and provider types. Um, and that, that policy is in effect the entire time that you're on an assignment with us. And that's something we cover. That's, that's part of what is included um, in our margin as we, provide assignments for for folks that are going out so yeah perfect um real fast just because this one just came in uh jack had asked about tail coverage yeah. as well yeah that's a great question so we get this all the time um in fact i uh i got this question so many times and i asked this question so many times that our insurance broker prepared a specific letter for this this very question essentially so Tail insurance is a term of art in the legal and insurance industry. Basically, it means if a locum company leaves the industry, um, then they have to purchase a tail policy. So if Wilderness Medical Staffing were to close its doors tomorrow, that's where we would purchase a tail insurance. We have no plans of doing that, by the way. Um, but uh, every year that we renew our policy, it backdates the entire history of the company. So um, last January, when we renewed our MedMal policy, it covered all of the events that happened before that, which is why it's such a, a massive expense for locums companies and providers if you're doing it on your own. Um, so to answer your question, uh, it doesn't matter if you stop working with us. Um, say you do one assignment with us and then you go on about your, maybe you go back to your uh, other job. It doesn't matter. That insurance policy is is covered. Uh, you're covered for any of the locums work you did with us. That's true of any of the policies that we staff. That is an essential thing to our business. So um, hopefully that answered your question there, Jack. But yeah, so it, it, the only kind of quibble, I, I wouldn't call it tail insurance because that has a specific meaning, but we do cover. Um, so regardless of the term, you, you can get a COI showing that you're covered for any locums work you do with us. Perfect. Thank you. Um, That's right, Jack. Yep. <laughs> see, this chat works out really well for us. We can't see you. We can't hear you. But your comments coming in <laughs> are quite helpful. We are, we're watching them as they're, as they're happening. So thanks a lot for those contributions and questions. All right. Uh, Joseph, I'm going to have you start with this one. Um, how do providers gain additional experience before working with, with WMS? And then either Ethan or Jade, you can also chime in a little bit with with typically what that experience needs to be for a lot of the jobs that we staff. I think the, um, the we really need to be jack of all trades. Certainly the places I've worked at Bravo Villages in Alaska and then a critical care, critical access hospital in Montana. You have to um, really at these locations I'm talking about uh, feel confident in a lot of different um, areas of medicine and probably the best way to, to get comfortable in a lot of different uh, pathologies is uh, in the emergency room. Uh, if you can work in an emergency room, you're going to see a lot of things, especially a high census emergency room volume, high volume, because um, you're going to see everything from, you know, sore throats to heart attacks to the occasional birth. 
Um, uh, and so you do need to be you know, as comfortable with children as you are with elders, um, as comfortable with managing diabetes as you are with suturing a laceration. Um, I, I think jack of all trades is really the best way to put it. In terms of certifications, um, ATLS, Advanced Trauma Life Support, um, helps you gain some perspective on uh, how to approach a trauma. Um, and of course, ACLS, that should go without saying, and PALS, and, and all of those uh, certificates that, uh, that most of us have anyway. But um, if you can add on that ATLS, it, um, it just takes your confidence level up how to approach a trauma systematically. You might not have all the equipment that you need in all the places that you go, but, um, but even still, ATLS uh, is, is a good overview and, um, and uh, worthwhile the use of your money and, as I mentioned, a tax deduction. So um, I think in high volume ER would be the best place to get your, your footing. Perfect. For at least yeah. a year. You know, I, I, some people two years, but, you know, at least a year of full time work uh, would be my advice. Awesome. Thank you. Ethan, Thank you. do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, just quickly. So I answer this question with great humility. I'm not a clinician. My background is, is uh, as an attorney, which put me on a desert island. Joseph's going to be saving lives. I'll be uh, writing scrolls on coconuts or something. But um, I, I would say one of the things that we've learned over the years, and um, we, we do have uh, cl clinicians involved with running the company, EM boot camp is a great one. I know we've talked about that in other webinars as well. Um, ATLS is a phenomenal course. We're actually, um, it's too late to sign up, but we are running a course down in Walla Walla, Washington on Thursday and Friday and Saturday of this week. So um, it's, it's a really demanding course, but um, the feedback is always tremendous about that one. So uh, those stand out for me. And, and to just e echo one of Joseph's points there, um, getting experience in a busy ER, especially where you're not just fast track, but really working in the ER is a critical foundational element to being able to go out somewhere where you can't predict what's going to come in the door. It might be anything from infant to geriatric and, and everything in between. Great. And, and Jade, I'll, I'll kind of ask you kind of a follow-up question to this one. For most of our assignments, we, we do require a certain amount of experience before providers kind of can work on many of the assignments that that we have. Are you able to speak a little bit to, to that and what, why that is, what that looks like for providers? Um, well, I think first and foremost, we, the last thing that we would want to do is send a provider out who wouldn't be comfortable or capable of handling what's going to be thrown at them. Um, we just would never, ever want to put a provider in that position. So our, our staffing team, our account executives do a really great job of vetting providers. Um, before placing them with clients, because, you know, we always want to have our providers backs be transparent about what they're going to be hit with once they get on that assignment. Um, and then, yeah, that's basically, we just want to make sure that the right people are matched to the right assignments. We do, a, a, I think we do a, a really great job of doing that. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, now, you guys, we're going to start to transition into assignments. Uh, as you've noticed, we've kind of been going through all the all the kind of prep work for all this. So now we want to start talking about what happens when you when you're almost getting ready to go. So, Ethan, are providers able to overlap with the previous provider so they're able to get a little bit of orientation from those people and information when they start those new assignments? Yeah. Uh Sorry to be a bad sport. I just want to want to fixate real quick. Mary Ellen mentioned we're going to have another ATLS course next year, at least one. Mm -hmm. And uh, Deanna will be sending emails about that. Please, please keep an eye out for that. Not only is it a great course with great instructors, you can find that all throughout the country. It's also an opportunity to be alongside other locum providers who have worked with us. And we host a dinner. So it gives you a chance to meet people like Joseph and and hear their experience and all that. So I uh, just want to put a special plug. 
Um, so the question was overlap. Is that possible? Um, it's whenever possible, we'd like to have an overlap. Um, and, and the reason is it just, it just helps to have it face to face where you're able to see the facility be introduced to people. Uh, it's not always possible. However, there's a lot of factors that play into it. Sometimes in our more remote locations, travel can be really demanding. There might be one helicopter flight a day um, and it just necessitates a very small overlap, if any at all. Um, we, Anytime a client asks me, I always recommend an overlap though for the reasons um, that I just kind of hit, but it isn't always possible because of that. Ultimately, the client is the one who sets the schedule because it's their facility. Um, but I'd love to hear from Joseph on this too, but I think it is a very valuable thing and we we make every effort to make that possible. If we aren't able to secure an actual overlap uh, overlap like that, we try to mitigate by doing two things. We'll try to introduce you to providers who've worked that location before uh, virtually so you can exchange, ask questions, that sort of thing. And then our team keeps really diligent notes about each assignment. So we track the staffing mix, the patient volume, um, any of the feedback that providers have given us about their experience on an assignment there. And we'll share all of that with you before you start your assignment. It's not quite the same, but it's a way to, to mitigate and, and give you the best information to succeed. Did you have anything on that, Joseph? You know, I um, every place is so different from the <laughs> other place you just left. True. I mean, I've, I've been in four or five different Alaska villages now, and they're just all different. Overlap would be great. It, in my experience, it almost never happens. I um, overlapped one time with uh, Kathy R., the amazing, <laughs> mighty Mike, Kathy. We overlapped in Fort Yukon and it was fine. I mean, it was fun to have a colleague there and, and you know, and talk shop, but uh, it almost never happens to me. And it, it might be where I'm going, but um, I'm alone uh, as the only provider and sometimes pretty much the only staff. So, uh, but that's not all places are like that. But it just so happens that uh, Fort Yukon is often like that. You, you don't have a nurse, um, you don't have a tech. Uh, you have someone from the community who drives the ambulance for you, and you also are 911. You go out on that ambulance. Exciting. It's cold in the winter, but, but not all places are like that. Perfect. Yeah, I would, I would just say, on average, the more remote an assignment is, the more challenging it is to provide the overlap. And I think mm -hmm. Joseph is an incredible provider. He's been out in some of these really uh, remote places. So I, I think I think that's. A, a very fair assessment of it. Um, again, we, we really see the value in it. Sometimes our hands are just tied based on the client's requirements or or travel, but we'll always advocate for that. And if we if we can't do it, we'll do whatever we can to make you feel prepared. Awesome. Okay, Joseph, I'm going to have you uh, start this one since you've got the most kind of experience being on location. Can you talk to the people who are joining us today a little bit about what housing is like? And then if you have any experience, and we can add to this as well. Um, we had some questions coming in about if providers are able to find their own housing or get a housing allowance. So Joseph, feel free to, to answer free that as much as it pertains kind of to your experience with, with housing while on assignment. Sure, I, housing again is different every place I go. When I go to little Plentywood, Montana, in the northeastern corner of Montana, I have a small, modest house right across the street from the hospital um, because I'm on call 24-7. You have to be able to zip across the street and be there. In Alaska, it varies. Um, the uh, probably most comfortable housing is uh, one location, Fort Yukon again, has a uh, set of condos right there on the property. It's you know, just a parking lot away. And then I've, I've literally slept on a couch in um, a break room in a tiny little village of, you know, three or 400 people. And uh, they just simply didn't have housing for the provider. And um, I've slept upstairs in kind of an attic of a clinic before. Um, no internet up there. Um, clinic had internet. But um, so it really varies all the way from, a you know, a modest house, a condo, hot uh, or a couch in a break room. And so I needed to get up and at them and clean 
everything, you know, tidied everything before the uh, staff came in at 730 because uh, they wanted their coffee. And of course, so um, it really varies, but there's always, uh, you know, place to sleep. And in my experience, always internet. It might not be convenient internet, but there's always internet. You have to have it basically to do your job these days because they use electronic medical records. And oftentimes that's the way you're communicating with a higher level of care. Not always, sometimes it's telephone, but um, but the internet is a huge plus. I, you know, I've, I've seen that kind of evolve through the decades that you can expect to have internet even in the middle of nowhere in Alaska these days. Perfect. Ethan or Jade, would you like to add any any to that in terms of how housing works when when we, you know, figure out contracts or, or what providers will know ahead of time about their housing? Mm -hmm. Well, we always try to get providers as much information as possible prior to obviously accepting or going on the assignment um, before. So just before they're about to fly out. So about a week before they go on assignment, we always send them an email. Um, and outlining all the details of their assignment, including what the housing details are, if there's laundry available, um, just as many details as we can so they feel as prepared as possible. Um, we also are trying to collect pictures of housing from all of our clients, so to make that available to providers so that you can see where you'll be staying. Um, um, yeah, some clients, they, they actually own certain apartments, so you'll always be going to the same apartment whenever you go there. Sometimes we have to find a hotel or something uh, every time you go to a certain client. So a lot of the answers to these questions are, it depends, which I know is frustrating, but it, it, Joseph is right. It varies so greatly from client to client. What about providers having the ability to find their own housing or getting a housing allowance? Were you going, did you want to talk, Ethan? I can't, but go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, like 99% of the time, housing is going to be prearranged by either the client or us. Um, there may be like a special circumstance that we can talk about, um, but that would that would require pre-approval prior to the assignment, just to make sure everything's buttoned up before, before the assignment is established. Yeah, Jade's exactly right on that. It, um, it varies quite a bit, but if you're in a small Alaska native village, uh, there's no Zillow, there's no whatever the rental equivalent of Zillow is. So very limited inventory. Oftentimes the client has already made the expense of securing a place for you to stay. Um, so it makes it difficult if we try to come in and, and with special arrangements. Uh, on occasion, those can be worked out, but I, I'd say it's, it's a very small minority of the time. Um, just to shoot you straight on that. Um, and yeah, so I'd say typically the clients already arranged the housing. And as Joseph said, uh, it, it can range from sleeping in a clinic to, to having a private house and everything in between. Uh, our goal is to tell you that as early on as we can accurately tell you um, and let you know. And then you can decide for yourself. So if, if you, uh, for whatever reason, need to have a particular arrangement for housing, we will try to disclose whatever the conditions are up front. So, you know, we do put in our contracts with every client that it be suitable, safe housing. Um, it's just the interpretation of that varies if you're on the outermost island of the Aleutian Islands or if you're somewhere uh, on Highway 90 in Montana. Perfect. Um, and, and I'm seeing some more of your questions coming in. Jack and, and Chelsea, Chelsea you have got answers uh, coming up for you in just a second here. Um, okay, Joseph, the next one is, is one for you. And this is one we get a lot of questions about. So I'll let you, you speak about it for a couple minutes here. Tra packing, traveling with food. How do you prepare food? How does this work when you're at locum tenens? Well, I'm happy to say I don't think I've ever missed a meal, but that's not to say I didn't pay a lot of money for the groceries in Alaska. But um, if you're going to a very remote place in Alaska, like let's say a fly in, there's no roads, then um, Jade will be able to tell you or one of her agents, one of her colleagues will tell you if there's a grocery store there. And um, and hopefully you'll get an idea of how big that grocery store is, because, you know, you can really truly really pay twelve dollars for a gallon of milk. And four dollars for an apple. You don't want to do that. So if you're going way out, you know, to say Fort Yukon, um, you want to pack your groceries out of the Fred Meyer in Fairbanks. 
they, they have boxes specifically for this. I think it's a five dollar fee, and they they know to do this. So you just ask. It's not like you're you're inventing the wheel. And then the uh, the little flight that you go out there on, probably a six or eight seater at the biggest. I've never seen one bigger than eight seats. Um, they know to pack. You, you put your name on the box on the outside, and because there's a lot of boxes. And so when you get to the other end, the little airstrip at the other end, all comes your groceries and you've paid, you know, Fred Meyer prices instead of um, the um, Alaska uh, commissary prices, the AC prices, or sometimes an, a no name type of grocery store with the, you don't, you wouldn't even really know it was a grocery store if you didn't look carefully. So, um, so once you get to where you're going, uh, you're going to have something to cook on. I remember the couch I slept on in um, uh, Medicotec. Alaska. I had a one eye burner and I had, it was a break room. So there was a sink. So one eye burner, microwave, sink, you're good to go. I, I, I can cook with that. That's truly a step up from camping. And then in Montana in Plentywood, I mean, I have a whole kitchen with more counter space than I have here in my personal home. So it, it, it does vary, but you're always going to have some way to cook. And if you're in Alaska passing through Fairbanks, um, go to the Fred Meyer. Perfect. And just just so uh, you all know, we've got some really in-depth articles on our blog that are on our website. So if you just visit wildernessmedicalstaffing.com, there's a, a link at the very top of the website that says blog. You can go ahead and look through some of those articles. We've got a couple about travel. We have a few about packing. We've got one specifically about food, um, one about housing. So they kind of provide a little bit more in-depth information about some of these questions with links out to different things like the Fred Meyer, how, how all that works, the Costco is an option and some of these um, kind of larger Alaska cities as well. So we try to provide additional information about that as well. Um, Jade, somebody asked this in the chat as well, but I wanna make sure we cover it. Are there opportunities for families to come, for pets or for multiple providers to be on one an assignment at a time? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I'm personally one of those people that I take my dog literally everywhere. So I understand people that want to bring their, their furry friends. Um, that's the same answer of it depends. It varies very widely from client to client. Um, we have some clients who have a very, uh, a very starch rule of no, no pets allowed period. Um, but we do have clients that would allow pets um, or even like if you want to bring a family member um, with pre-approval. So rather than like bringing that on us or just bringing them, that's just something that we would ask if you could tell us early on and if you could tell us often so we know to plan on that. Um, depending on the assignment with pre-approval, we can make it work. Great. Thank you. All right, Joseph, back to you, and then I'll, I'll let either Jade or, or Ethan kind of chime in on this. Do the healthcare facilities themselves provide any sort of orientation for new locum tenants who arrive? Uh, yes, it's usually the uh, overarching uh, cooperative, for instance, Bristol Bay Area Health Co Cooperative in uh, Alaska or the Tanana Chiefs Conference in Alaska. Um, they have a, a day, maybe two working days of uh, orientation in their big facility. Um, and big is relative here, but, you know, um, so BBAHC is in Billingham, Alaska. Tanana Chiefs Conference is in Fairbanks. So you you kind of park yourself there when you first go out on one of these assignments. Um, in Plentywood at the Critical Access Hospital, um, the orientation really, really focused on how to use the EMR, how to use Cerner. And so um, I don't recall that there was, you know, other orientation except for just people showing me around and things like that. But there was no like day or two of sit down and learn. You do need that sit down and learn before you go out to a village, because if you've never done anything like work in a village, then you need to hear how how they do it, how they expect. How how do you, um, uh, you know, write, write these electronic um, prescriptions because it's different when you're in a village than when you're when you're in the city at the uh, base. So they teach you these things, and um, and that's what the orientation is about. Perfect. We do, we do have some clients as well, and I feel like this happened during COVID, where sometimes we can complete part of the orientation at home. Like the clients can actually email providers something that they can take care of before they even go on the assignment to shorten orientation. 
Um, but and we would let you know if that was the case with your assignment. Perfect. And um, Joseph touched on EMR systems a, a little bit, but Ethan, do you have anything to, to add in terms of what the best way might be for providers to learn how to use those systems since they can differ from facility to facility? Oh, we can't hear you, Ethan. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, again, I approach this with great humility because I've never had to learn an EMR. Uh, my my wife is a physician and we obviously work with medical providers every day. The only tidbits I would pass on is that it's important to know, um, you know, we, and we've tried to build this into our process. So if you're going to an assignment at location X, we will try to prepare you to know hey, they use Cerner or Epic, whatever the system is, so you know in advance. Um, most of the time, the clients are the ones who facilitate that. They should hopefully connect you uh, with a person at the facility who can help get you up to speed in that system if you've not used it. But but really um, want to hear from Joseph on this one. I, th I think it's a great question, though. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah they're different everywhere you go. And um, I think twice now I've... I've had uh, two different locations that both use CERN or, and that was unusual. But anyway, I, I think the most important single thing you can do is know the telephone number of your IT person that can answer questions because you're going to back yourself into a corner. I certainly do. And you can't get out of it. So you can't complete the chart. So it, it, on and on. Um, so, you know, be flexible. It, keep in mind that other people have done it. You can do it too. It's frustrating at times. But um, I know your IT person and um, send them chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great, great pro tip. Bribe with candy to get additional training. <laughs> Um, what types of, uh, uh, Joseph, this one's kind of for, for you. And then um, Jade, if you want to join in just based on kind of your work with providers, but what types of equipment are available for providers at the facilities? Um, kind of referring to x-rays, labs, CT, et cetera. Are they able to, to do consultations or telemedicine um, with any of the facilities? What should they expect in terms of, of what kinds of tools they'll have at their disposal? Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, you're going to have a crash cart, and so you need to be able to use it. Um, you're everywhere. Everywhere I've been, uh, there, you know, was the I had the ability to intubate if I needed to. Um, even even some small villages I went to in Alaska had X-ray, so you need to be able to shoot your own X-rays. There is no X-ray tech, and I've never been at a, a village that had a, a ventilator. So you're going to be doing a lot of bagging. But remember, you've got community people who will help you uh, if you do end up uh, needing to bag someone um, for airway. Um, telemedicine, yes, there is a way to quite frequently, I think all the time, speak to a doctor or another healthcare care provider um, just like this virtually. You can do that. Or you can do a uh, telephone, too, if you want to. But um, if there is telemedicine. Um, you're not going to be calling them every day, but um, it is reasonable um, to, uh, to dial up this person. Uh, they're in my case, they're either going to be in Fairbanks or Anchorage, and um, and, uh, and when I'm in Plentywood, they're actually in South Dakota. But uh, but virtual consult uh, really happens, and it's good to have that safety net, and it's good to use it when you need it because not, there's not one of us that knows everything. And sometimes we put our heads together, we do better. So. Um, it, 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 and it may not be your quote unquote supervising position. I've never met my supervising position in Alaska at any assignment I've ever been in. But that's not to say I don't talk to doctors. I talk to, to physicians all the time and um, they just, you know, don't really know me. But um, but neither does my supervising position. So uh, you know, there's always going to be somebody to ask questions of. Perfect. J Jade or, or Ethan, would you like to add any additional information to that? I'll just kind of chime in really quickly here that people are going to hate me, but this is another situation where it depends because we have clients who have like one of our clients actually just built a brand new gorgeous facility. They just barely opened. And then we have other clients who are like a small clinic room. Um, but what I can say is that we will do our best to portray it as accurate, accurately as possible prior to going out. Perfect. Um, 
This was a question that, that came in. Joseph, you're probably going to be best suited to answer this one. What happens if a patient's care needs a higher level facility or if there's an emergency? As a provider, how do you address that? Sure. Well, there are going to be emergencies. I can guarantee you that. Um, you uh, call for a medevac. First of all, you stabilize the patient to the best of your ability. And um, and then just like a, any EMTALA-driven uh, process, you uh, you call. Uh, in Alaska, you're going to be calling probably Fairbanks or Anchorage and um, do a doc doc. So you're going to get, get a receiving doctor at the other end. And oftentimes, um, either that entity will call uh, for a flight or you call for a flight, um, Guardian, uh, LifeNet, and uh, arrange the flight. And they'll be there weather permitting. It doesn't always work out. Sometimes you have that critical patient for hours, even a day or two because of weather. But um, so you you might end up running a little ICU all on your own right there without the without the equipment. But um, you do you know it's Alaska is a is a wild wonderful place and it's not always suitable for air travel, uh, especially with these little planes. Uh, and so you do you do call for medevac. You follow all the Impala steps just like you would in a regular ER. You complete your documentation for Impala. Perfect. Um, we just to do a kind of a quick check in on time since we've got about 10 minutes left. I want to make sure that we're able to get through. Um, we've just got a couple questions that we wanted to touch on to kind of uh, wrap the question portion of this up. And then Joseph uh, was kind enough to kind of put together some photos um, from his time on some of these assignments. Um, so you can go into a little bit more detail about those. So if you guys are able to stay on, we might just run a little long. If you're able to stay on, we'd love to, to kind of go through those. I'm hoping, I'm crossing my fingers that if you do have to bounce out, it'll be part of the recording that sends out. I'm not 100% sure if it'll record after kind of our hour or not just based on the software, but I'm I'm hoping that it does. So um, hopefully you can stick around for that because I'd love, I'd love for you to be able to see some of those kind of on-site type photos. So um, let's finish up with our, our questions here. Kind of going off of, you know, if a provider's at the facility, what happens if they get sick while they're on their rotation? Um, how does that work? And, and Ethan, I'll have you kind of address this first. Yeah, it's a big question and it's quite broad. I'd say the, the factors that go into it are the contracts. So sometimes clients will specifically negotiate terms on this. We, we also have proactively negotiated terms, particularly with COVID. Because uh, we wanted some provisions in there to protect providers who would be exposed to COVID on assignment, what would happen? Um, so I would kind of put that lens on it and say it depends a little bit on the contract. The other thing that matters is is how sick you are. We've um, we've staffed hundreds, if not thousands, of providers over the twelve years we've been a company. Typically, if it's something shorter, more acute, if you, you just have a temporary illness you're often able to be accommodated at the site, rest, recover, get back to work. If it is something more severe, which unfortunately has come up from time to time, we'll just make arrangements with the client to get you home so you can be cared for. Um, again, we've, we've been in business over a decade. A number of scenarios have come up along the spectrum and it, it just requires good communication between the provider, the client and WMS and, um, We've gotten really adept at handling those situations, but they all they all tend to look unique um, in their in their own light. But uh, hopefully, hopefully that gives a little bit of context. Perfect, thank you. All right, this next question, Joseph, I I think you'll have a pretty good handle on. This is a question that we get fairly often. It's kind of a fun question, but but one that I think uh, people have want to know about. Should providers be concerned about wildlife while they're on assignment? <laughs> Yes, uh, Alaska doesn't have handrails or fences much, and so um, you can you could possibly hurt get yourself hurt. When you when you see um, uh, the slides, hopefully we get a chance to see this. You're going to see a, a Russian blue fox, and uh, and they will bite you. And uh, I've actually treated that injury myself. Um, I've treated shark bites, not in Alaska. I've treated um, you know bear scratches. It, you, you really, 
I, I went on one assignment out with Wilderness, and uh, you had to be trained in a 12 gauge shotgun because the perimeter had so many polar bears. So, yeah, it's uh, it, that's why we love Alaska. You know, you don't know what's behind every tree, or and if you're on the tundra, there are no trees, and you can see the moose coming at you. Yeah, Ethan, you've got experience living in Alaska as well. Do you have any any tidbits you'd like to add about that? Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, I had the great privilege to spend part of my childhood growing up in Alaska in an Alaska native village. Um, wildlife is not just the Discovery Channel thing in Alaska. It is it is real. Um, there are, you know, particularly in the interior of Alaska, but also true southeast, southwest. Um, there, bears are a real threat and um one of the things we try to do in preparing people for an assignment is to collect uh, feedback we've gotten from other providers, talk to locals and provide you with some kind of inside baseball on what you should expect for that. Um, it does get a little tricky. We always recommend people have bear spray. Bear spray is very hard to travel with because the airlines uh, don't want it accidentally going off and, and blinding everyone on the plane. Um, so one of the things that our account executives who work with you on filling assignments are very adept at doing is telling you, okay, you're going to Kodiak. Kodiak is world famous for having uh, these prehistoric killing machine Kodiak bears. Uh, <laughs> so here's here are some steps you can take to mitigate. But um, but I think what Joseph said is really the key here. This is this is why so many of us in, in this field um, are are so passionate about Alaska. It is unlike any other place in the country and in the world. Um, so it's something you have to be mindful of, respectful of, um, but there are ways you can prepare for it. And I, I think um, it starts with awareness though. Yeah. Perfect. All right. I think this is going to be our last kind of planned question that we have here. Um, and then I want to switch over to, to Joseph's slideshow for just a minute. Um, but are there ways to prepare for providers to join into these communities that they may be serving in terms of culture, lifestyle, et cetera? As, as I think it was Ethan mentioned, we, we do serve a lot of Alaska Native and Native American communities. So are, are just smaller villages in general, just different small remote areas. Are there ways to prepare for that? Joseph, go ahead and, and I'll let you answer first. Oh, sure. I've, I've been invited to the school play, the church potluck, the uh, someone's Thanksgiving dinner with their, you know, three generations of family around the table. Um, I'll be in Fort Yukon over Thanksgiving and I feel certain I will not spend that day alone. I'll, I'll spend it working, but not every minute. Um, I've eaten bear meat, fresh salmon, um, everything that you can imagine that they, you know, they, the berries, the um, uh, during berry season that people share. And, uh, and, you know, and I try to share of myself, I, uh, you know, you, you don't go hunting and fishing so much when you're there. I, I'm on call 24 seven, but, um, but people will feed you. They, they want to share their culture. And that's, that's part of the joy of it. You get to do things that no tourist could ever do day in and day out. You're seeing things, you're seeing the inside of houses. Um, you're seeing people's lives for real. Uh, there's nothing made up about it. And I, and I love that genuine authenticity um and it keeps me going back even though uh, these villages can be tough to work in sometimes but uh tremendously rewarding that's that's great ethan would you like to add on to that at all yeah first of all i absolutely love this question i, I think it's one of the single most important things that you can do as a locum provider before taking an assignment with us is to really consider the place you're going and and endeavor to learn about the culture and the community and the people that you would be serving. They're all unique. We, we've talked a lot in this episode about Alaska kind of period, but um, as Joseph well knows, you know, anyone who's been to Alaska, Fairbanks, that interior area of Alaska is so radically different from Southeast or Southwest, uh, different cultures there. So, um, I think it's important to approach it with with humility and go as a guest. Um, you know, some of the some of the clinics might be run differently than than a big city ER in Chicago or something. Maybe you've worked with 
they they all have their own pace and management style and stuff. So I think just approaching it uh, with the mindset of of being a guest and really uh, showing genuine interest in people's culture is received very well in Alaska. Um, I think the same thing is true, maybe to a lesser extreme in Montana as well. Um, but but yeah, just just thinking of it as an opportunity for cultural exchange and and approaching with humility is a really key thing that um, I think the most successful providers do on each assignment. They don't they don't approach an assignment saying, "Hey, I've done Alaska before. I'll do this one the same." I think um, approaching each assignment and and um, going into it individually is really important. The final thing I'd say on this too, uh, I'm a I'm a big reader. Um, I, I probably drone on too much to Jade and Deanna about this sometimes, but I, I couldn't resist. I just read a book um, about Alaska. I would say if you're also a reader, I would really endeavor to read about the places you're going. So I just read Shadows on the Koyakon, which is by um, an Alaska native uh, author. And he's talking about his childhood growing up in Alaska and focusing on the Athabascans, but also talking about different different tribes. And um, it's a beautiful way to understand the history. So, yeah. That's kind of to add on, I was just yeah. going to say, we absolutely love when providers send us pictures and they do often. It's mm -hmm. super cool. But what comes to mind is a couple of years ago, a provider in Alaska was asked to participate in a sacred well ceremony in the, the village that he was in. Um, and he said that was one of the coolest experiences he's ever had. Um, and then also another provider in Montana who's actually been out there for, I think, two years now straight working this assignment has been so um, immersed and, and accepted by the community that they they made her one of their sacred tradi traditional quilts and mm -hmm. presented that to her and her husband. Um, so I would I would give advice of um, going in with an open mind and respectful of other people's cultures. Yeah, we really do get uh, we we absolutely love it when providers send us in photos from their assignments. This is actually a great transition because I'm going to pull Joseph's photos up now. Thank you guys for your input for the question. You guys just bear with me for one second. I'm hoping I can get my my tech to work here. Give me just a second. Yay. OK, I hopefully you guys can all see that. All right, here we go. OK, so I wanted to just touch on a couple of these stories real quick. Um, and so I'll just have you kind of tell us a little bit about some of these photos. I think this one's Bristol Bay. Yep. Bristol Bay is, of course, on the sort of southwestern part of Alaska, and um, it allows for 85% of North America's uh, salmon catch every year. And on the left, you can see it beginning to freeze. And on the right is, um, that is Good News Bay um, on Bristol Bay, a very westerly little village. Now, once that water freezes over, they use it like a highway. They drive on it. Uh, they play on it. It's a soccer pitch. It's everything else. And then, um, and then when it starts to thaw in the spring, they call that the breakup because the ice starts to break up and go back out to the, uh, the Bering Sea. Thank you. I think our next one yeah. might be out of Good News Bay. Same, so same area is that? Yes, is that right. That, right. That's Good News Bay, way out on the western part of Bristol Bay, very, very near the Bering Sea. And uh, you can see the roads are all dirt and muddy. And um, and on the right, I was there, in, you know, during good weather. And I think it was getting, oh, maybe late August. So it's chilly. Uh, or September, it starts to get chilly, definitely. That's the Good News River. And um, I had gone out fishing with a, with a uh, native man there. And we uh, went just as far as we knew my call phone would still pick up a signal. I <laughs> uh, didn't go any further because it, you have to get, you have to have that call phone in your pocket. Um, so Good News Bay is one of the places that has a teeny tiny little grocery store where, you know, you might want to buy a Coke, but not much more. <laughs> I think the, the next couple of slides I, I put together, they were just a couple additional photos that, that you had sent over. So feel free to go into as much detail mm -hmm. or little as you'd like to on these ones. Yep, on the left is a, an unusually clear day. That's Denali, which of course means the Great One. It used to be called Mount McKinley, tallest mountain in uh, North America. And um, I, uh, years ago, I rode my bicycle 
from uh, North Carolina to the Arctic Circle and uh, had several clear days as I was going by uh, Denali Park, Denali National Park. Um, on the right, if you can barely make out, there's a rainbow going over um, the um, the common gathering house. It's like a public house uh, used for um, all sorts of gatherings. It's, uh, it's kind of like a church, but without the religious part. Um, and that's that's also Good News Bay. It was Good News Bay was a photogenic sort of place. <laughs> yeah, I think we've gotten several photos in from providers from that area, all kind of different. Very, but I I recognize that building from from several that we've gotten in. These ones, oh, I love the colors on these ones. They're just beautiful and yeah. and kind of look yeah. fishing related. They are. Uh, Valdez is um, in the far uh, southern part of the state, south of uh, Anchorage, and that's on the left there. And, and um, that you might recognize Tanana there on the right, uh, Ethan. Uh, that's fishing right there on, yeah. on the river. And they are hanging the fish, of course, to, to dry. And um, at summertime, you can see the way they're dressed and the fact that they're hauling in a fish catch like that. It is summertime in Tanana. So cool. Um, and then, of course, uh, I couldn't forget to add your uh, wildlife photos and the pictures <laughs> of the dogs because they are such a big part yeah. of of Alaska, especially as you mentioned. Yeah, we remember that fishing trip I told you about, but just to the edge of where the call phone cuts out. Um, well, we were had been sharing the the beach with previously there had been a bear there, obviously. That's not even a big bear. That's my foot, which is not a big foot, but <laughs> that's probably a small bear, um, as bears go. And the beach was just covered with bear prints. They like to fish too. Um, Behind a dog sled, mushing, and uh, years ago I um, house at a uh, ranger's house in Denali National National Park, and uh, she took me for a dog sled ride, and um, and then on the right is that fox that will bite you, and um, it's uh, the Russian blue, and that was on uh, the island of Shemya, which is the westernmost island in the Aleutians, 150 miles from uh, the coast of Russia. So cool. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for sharing those photos. We we really appreciate it. I think it, I mean, you don't really get to envision it unless you kind of are able to see it. So thank you for, for sending all of, all of those into us. We really appreciate it. Um, hold on. I'm going to just turn my little slide deck off there. Okay. There we go. Um, everyone who joined us, thank you so much for sending in your questions and, and to, to Jade and Ethan and Joseph, especially. Thank you so much for answering our questions as well. We really appreciate it. For our guest panelists, do you have any closing comments for our guests as they wrap up with us today? I'll jump in here real quick just to say thank you all for coming. Um, this is something, this was Deanna's brainchild. And uh, to be honest, when we we're starting this endeavor, we didn't know what the interest level would be. It's thrilling to us to be able to engage with all of you. I would say if um, if this meant something to you, if you took something from us, please let us know. It's great mm -hmm. feedback for us. We can um, continue to do these in the future. And uh, if you've got questions we didn't get to, let us know. We'd love to tackle those next time. Um, yeah. But yeah, just tremendously grateful for everyone for showing up. We're, we exist as a company uh, to, to help support these rural communities by bringing folks like you out there and, and having them do an excellent job. So really fun to engage with everyone and, and hear about Joseph's experiences as well. Yeah, thank you. Speaking of that, Ethan, uh, we will actually be sending out a quick survey to you um, after the webinar. If you're able to go ahead and just take a few minutes to fill it out, if you complete it in its entirety, we'll go ahead and pick a a uh, one of the people who have attended here today to receive a $50 REI gift card. So we really encourage you to fill that out. It's it's how we get your feedback so we can continue hosting uh, webinars like this one. And we always try to make them so they're going to be topics and conversations that you guys will want to pay attention to and get some information out of. And hopefully we'll get you excited about the kind of, of work that we do. Also, as you know, I'm the marketing director, so I've got to tell you to uh, stay up to date with our blog. We've got uh, all 
things coming in our social media all the time, including additional provider photos that we post there a lot. Um, we have a newsletter that we send out every other week. So make sure you get those if you don't already. And we also have job alerts on our website that you can sign up for uh, from our open jobs page. So again, thank you so much to everyone for joining us. We really appreciate it. We'll let you get back to your day. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye, guys.